everyone. Um, thank you so much, Rosemary, for that warm welcome. It's wonderful to be here in Newcastle on Awabakal and Waramai country um, to discuss this incredible and important book that Jen and Kena have written. How Many More Women is a deeply researched investigation of how the law is used to silence women, which is brought to life by the stories of the many women who spoke to you. Before we get into the discussion though, I did just wanna say that given the nature of this book, we are going to be discussing things tonight, such as sexual violence and intimate partner abuse. Um, and statistically, we know that there will be, probably be people in this audience who have experienced these things. Um, so if there are issues that are raised for you during the discussion, please know that there's support available. You can call 1-800-RESPECT or Lifeline. And also if you've come with a friend tonight, just check in with them. These things are incredibly difficult to talk about, but I think as we'll discuss, it's really vital to be able to talk about them. Um, Kena and Jen, there's so much to dig into in this book. Um, to start though, I kind of wanted to ask about its genesis. Um, it's been five years this month since um, Tarana Burke's Me Too movement went, you know, globally viral. Um, and so I was wondering like, why now did you want to write a book about this subject, about how women are silenced by the law? What was it about this period in history that you felt a book needed to be written on this subject? Well, first, thank you for hosting us and for taking part with us in this. Uh, and hello, everybody. Great to be in Newcastle. So we decided to write this book because um, what we were seeing in our practices. So in the post-Me Too world, we saw women breaking the cultural silence around talking about gender-based violence. And what we were seeing in our practices, much of which you never, never reaches the public domain, is this legal backlash. So an avalanche of defamation claims, an increased visibility around non-disclosure agreements and the ways in which they silence women from speaking out. And so we both were advising uh, in-house media organisations on breaking Me Too stories within newspapers. So we both had a close understanding of the difficulties that journalists face getting those stories over the line um, and how difficult it is for women liaising with journalists to get their stories told. We were also, uh, we advised frontline services organisations, rape crisis centres were coming to us to ask for advice about defamation, women, journalists, um, friends and family members who spoke in support of their loved one who had spoken out about their experience of abuse. And we were frustrated by it. And so long before the Depp case came across my desk, Kane and I were talking about this. And the reason we started, we decided to do a book was a particular case that we opened the book with. And it's called Stocker and Stocker. Uh, it's a case that went to the UK Supreme Court. And we were instructed, it was a case involving a woman who posted on Facebook about her experience of domestic abuse. Um, the outcome, I'll explain the case, but the outcome was outrageous. And Kane and I were instructed by Liberty, which is a British civil rights organization, a leading human rights organisation to intervene in the case to try to make certain arguments about women's right to free speech and we were denied ability to do so. So the book is really what we would have argued in the Supreme Court had we been able to. So in that case, Nicola Stocker was uh, <laughs> writing on the Facebook wall, I don't know how many of you use Facebook, I'm presuming most people, but uh, writing on the Facebook wall of her former partner, Mr Stocker's new girlfriend, and she posted on her status update, so there was a public discussion on her wall between them discussing the, his history of violence. And in one of the posts, she said, well, the, there was that time that he tried to strangle me. Police don't take too kindly to finding red marks around your throat. Now, he sued her for defamation. It was seen by the partner and some of her friends and family, and he sued her for defamation. So what was a post that might have been seen by 20 people or something then became a national news story because he sued her for defamation. And even though she had evidence of the red marks around her throat from police who attended the incident two hours afterwards, um, she lost her defamation case. Now, why did she lose her defamation case? Because the judge determined that the word to say to strangle and the definition in law and in the dictionary he consulted of strangulation means that you, did, you grab someone by the throat with the intention to kill them. So because she was alive, so she survived. Um, the judge's words in, this, in the judgment were, um, his intention was to silence her, not to kill her. 
And uh, we thought that was quite ironic because it was a case in which she was then being prevented from being able to tell her truth about domestic violence. So whatever he didn't achieve through strangling her, the law achieved. And so we were so pissed off about this. Um, I swear a lot, I apologise. That, that's, that was tame by, <laughs> by what may well come out of my mouth this evening. Um, we were so angry and there were like headlines, green light for abusers. Um, but So we wanted to intervene and make these arguments about a women's right. It's not just about his right to reputation, her right to free speech. It's also about our right to live free from violence and our right to equality as women. And so... Sadly, the UK Supreme Court refused to hear us. She went on to win the case, but only after seven years of being silenced and prevented from speaking her truth and facing hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of legal costs and damages. Um, but really, what we tell the story in the book is that the arguments that we tried to make in the Supreme Court have since been deployed in courts around the world, including in the Colombian Constitutional Court for much better outcomes for women. So we, we set that out in the book. Sorry, that's a really long answer to a short question. <laughs> no, and I, I do really want to talk about the Colombian example um, maybe a little further on in the discussion. But I think that that tension that you talked about, um, you know, his reputation versus her right to speech, and it seems like reading the book that, you know, if you think about even the scales of justice that are on the front cover, that the balance is really off, that reputation is being weighed as, as far more important than a woman's right to speak about violence that she's experienced. And that just seems quite antithetical to the law, right? Like, that reputation is being um, given more weight than safety. And I just wonder, how did we get to this point? Like, how did it come to be that, that reputation is more important than safety? Well, I think there's a lot in that question. Um, <laughs> Not the entire history of law, but I... <laughs> <laughs> we do try to set out the history of law in chapter one, or two. We do. Two. <laughs> <laughs> we do. And I think, you know, one of the things about the weighing scales, just to start there, is that the problem with defamation law is that you have the right to reputation versus the right to free speech. But the way free speech is protected when it comes to defamation cases is by these very narrow defences. Um, one of the points that we make in the book is that the problem with these defences is that they're underdeveloped and they, there's a hidden gender uh, in relation to them. So arguments with respect to the public interest, for example, haven't taken into account the public interest in people being able to come forward and being able to speak about experiences or allegations of gender-based violence. So that's just, I guess, one point. And another point I think that's really important in these balancing scales is that his right to reputation or someone's right to reputation, if you lose a defamation case, you have to pay huge damages. If you're sexually harassed in the workplace mm. or if you suffer from sexual assault, in comparison, any civil damages that you would get, or I, I'm not sure in this jurisdiction what you get in terms of um, criminal compensation schemes, but those are minuscule in comparison to what you get with respect to your reputation being damaged. So you've got big imbalances there, just if we're looking at um, defamation. In terms of how it all started with defamation law, <laughs> One of my favorite parts of this book was learning about how it all started. And I remember getting the part of the book from Jen that, where she was writing the history of defamation law. And it turns out that it has a lot to do with Alexander Hamilton and, <laughs> and dueling. And it did mean that while I read through that chapter, I had the song from Hamilton in my head <laughs> the whole time. And I hope it doesn't happen to you because it still happens when I read that, that chapter in defamation. <laughs> um, well, look, it's catchy at least. So um, I think I, as I work as a journalist and so a lot of what you do as a journalist or editor in Australia is you're sort of triaging can we tell this story? And the thing that's always in the back of your mind is defamation. Mm. Um, and it's really, really difficult in Australia to publish stories criticising powerful and wealthy people. Um, and you always feel like you get to a point where you just have to jump and hope that they don't sue. There's, there's no safe story. And I wonder if you've seen in your practices and in your work it doesn't feel like it's any easier to publish a Me Too story now than it was five years ago. It actually feels like it's harder. Um, I wonder if that 
is reflected in, in the work you've done in the law? Do you see that getting harder? Well, I don't know if it's harder necessarily, but certainly it's expensive. Mm. And most media organisations don't have the budget to be able to fight these cases. So we write about it. There's a chapter in the book called Her Guidebook to His Playbook. Mm. And that's really, when you read it, you will never look at another media story in the newspaper the same way ever again, because we take you through what it looks like uh, and the strategies that are used to stop these stories ever getting into the public domain. And so the stories that you see in the media are the tip of the iceberg. They're the stories that made it. Um, they're the stories that weren't self-censored because of defamation threats. There wasn't a privacy injunction or suppression order put in place to stop you from talking about it. Um, but we interview in-house counsel and one of our colleagues at the Times, Pia Sama, she's a brilliant, uh, brilliant female in-house lawyer who we've both worked with. She said, if we publish a story about an alleged rape and we get it wrong, just the cost and the apology would be at least a quarter of a million pounds. So you've got to be thinking about your legal budget every single time you think about reporting these stories. And then if you defend it, you're into the millions of pounds. So that's the Times. They, it's News Limited. It's Rupert Murdoch. They have money. But for like the, the regional papers here, there's no way they could afford to break a story like that. And so it's limiting the space in which we can have these conversations in the media because of the cost risk involved in trying to publish them. But as we talk about in the book, the media plays a really important role in deterring violence in society or, or indeed propagating it mm. uh, in the way that we, the journalists write about violence in the way that we talk about it. So these stories are so important, but we want to make people, you know, there's this perception, post me too, you can say whatever you want, post online, it's not a problem. I mean, it's not just journalists, that's just in the context of, of your work as a journalist, mm. but people tweeting, women facing hugely expensive cases that draw out for years for tweeting in support of a friend who made a rape allegation. It's really serious. Mm. And I think, I mean, you mentioned the role that the media has um, in diminishing violence in society, but also, you know, perpetrating tropes about um, these things. And one of the cases that um, you go into that I think is is really interesting is the case of Erin Jane Novel. Mm. Um, well, obviously, it's actually not her case, right? It's so the actor Jeffrey Rush sued the Daily Telegraph over a story about a private complaint that she made to her employer, um, alleging, you know, that he had acted inappropriately towards her. And that private complaint ended up on the front page of a newspaper without any comment from her. And then she ends up in court having to sort of defend her story. And I think that's a really interesting theme in the book about how if you run a truth defense to defamation, well, then your truth is on trial. Um, and a woman has to get up there and, and sort of convince people to a very high threshold that something that potentially happened in private um, is true. And it's very hard to prove that in court. I mean, it's always hard to prove in court. Obviously, in a defamation case, you're dealing with a civil standard of proof. So rather than the beyond reasonable doubt standard, which we have in our criminal justice system, it's to the civil standard of on the balance of probabilities or as uh, more likely than not that it happened. But what we wanted to write about in, I think Erin Jean Norville's case is really important and it's one that everybody in this country knows very well because it was Jeffrey Rush, it was all over the media. But for women whose stories are reported by the media, and her case is an interesting one because she didn't give her consent to that to being reported, nor was she asked, even asked for comment. So it, this poor woman gets, makes a confidential complaint just wanting it to stop. That was her story, she wanted it to stop had no intention of it ever being in the media. She didn't want to be a public figure associated with this. She didn't want stories reported about it. Um, and because the media reported her story, she was put in the invidious position. All you can do as a woman whose story is reported in that circumstance, you're not the defendant in the case. They've sued the newspaper. It was the same position that Amber Heard was in in the United Kingdom. They sue a newspaper. They say you're lying because that's in a defamation claim. If it's, de it's not defamatory if it's true. So they're saying you're lying about it. The only way you can defend your truth or have any agency in respect of the proceedings is to offer to be a witness and to offer your testimony. And you put yourself forward and it's the same old, tired, sexist tropes that are rolled out, that we see rolled out in the criminal justice system, that we now have additional protections for in the criminal justice system. You can't ask a woman about her form, previous sexual history. You know, there's certain no-go areas for, for terms of cross-examination, though in recent reported cases, you'd be surprised to know that there are rules because they don't seem to be followed. Um, but 
there's no such protections in a civil justice context, and we, we write about that, that it's unacceptable. When you've got these civil courts dealing with gender-based violence, women should have the same protections, whether you're in a criminal or a civil uh, case. Mm -hmm. And so what we wanted to write was like what women's lived experience of the law is. So you either are sued personally and you face bankruptcy, and, but at least you have control over the proceedings. If a newspaper is sued and you don't give evidence, they could choose to settle for commercial reasons. Even if you choose to give evidence, they could still choose to settle for commercial reasons. And what does that say about your truth? So, no agency. Exactly, but nobody, th because we work in this area and we've had to engage with these cases, we deal with these women who are going through this, it's, it's really heartbreaking and disempowering. Um, something that I think is really important in the book and, and what you've done with it is that, you know, often in Australia, I think we look at the Australian context, the US context and, and the UK, um, but you've, you've made this a very global book and, you know, there are stories of uh, what women are going through in Latin America. Um, you know, you talk about how the Me Too hashtag in China is banned, like this is a really global phenomenon. Um, and there's a story from Japan where a journalist um, named Shiori Ito um, ac accused a sort of senior media executive of, um, of raping her. And I think the thing that's really incredible about that story is, you know, what she faced and the, the level of trolling and backlash and, and all of that, but also how she sort of found ways to fight back, which were really interesting. I wonder, Kena, if you could kind of talk about her story a little bit and sort of what she was able to do with the law. Yeah, I mean, Shiori's case, I don't know if it's a case that people in Australia are aware of. She's known now as the the leading or the leader of the Me Too movement in Japan. And she was a young journalist and an, an intern at the time, actually, who um, brought uh, an accusation of sexual assault against a very senior, very well-connected uh, uh, broadcaster and journalist who was friends with the then Prime Minister at the time. Um, and Shiori uh, reported the matter to the police um, and faced uh, a really horrific experience uh, with respect to the investigation. And and you can you can read about it in the book. I won't, I won't go into detail um, about that now. And because the police decided not to uh, arrest the uh, the accused um, and to close the investigation, she decided to hold a press conference. And in that press conference, she said, I want this to be reopened and I want it to be um, investigated and I want justice. And on the basis of that, he sued her in defamation um, for a lot of money. And Shiori decided that she was going to counter sue him um, because he was calling her a liar. Um, so she, she wins in the civil court um, and the court finds in the balance of probabilities uh, that it was uh, more likely than not that uh, he did sexually assault her. And this has now taken absolutely years and years and even when we were Fin the, doing the finishing touches of the book, the Supreme Court case came down in that case where the Supreme Court upheld um, her defamation claim against him. So it said that, yes, it was more likely that he did rape her, um, but he had, a, he had brought a second countersuit against her because she had published a book. Um, and in that, she lost that other countersuit um, because she says in her story that she believes that she was... Um, it raped, but there was no testing done at the time, so she couldn't prove that element of her story, even though she was able to prove the other elements. And then since then, she has gone on to start suing other people. So the trolling she has faced online has been absolutely horrific. She was exiled. She moved to London to get away from it, and that's where I first met her. Um, and... Uh, People have been going online, they've been calling her a North Korean spy and uh, calling her a liar. And she decided to sue one of these individuals who was calling her a liar and making up this allegation. They said it was for political motives. Um, and it turned out that he was in fact a prominent <laughs> university law professor uh, in Japan. She wins that case against him, and she's now bringing a very, very interesting test case, at least for, I think, us lawyers, it's incredibly interesting, uh, which is that she's suing a politician which pressed, wh who pressed like. So someone said Shiori Ito is lying about the sexual assault, and this politician 
liked it on Twitter, um, and now she's suing that uh, politician, saying that she's creating this environment of harassment and for defamation. So that's definitely one to watch. But it, it's it's taking its toll on her. It's you know litigation is extremely stressful. It's extremely expensive. She's a young woman who's now being thrust into the, the spotlight, um, but she's she's fighting back through the law. Mm. I was curious about that because I think, you know, we see people that are quite high profile and they're, um, you know, fighting these cases. They have this cause that they feel really strongly about. But you must both see the toll that that takes privately, years and years of litigation and stress and, you know, feeling like, what happens if I lose? What happens for the people who come after me if I lose? Um, and the precedent that that sets. Is, is that a difficult part of this that a lot of people don't see, that, that mental stress? Um, I mean, for sure. We quote, um, uh, we actually quote a British journalist, Carol Cadwaller, well, Welsh journalist, I should say, uh, who, who was sued by um, Aaron Banks in the United Kingdom for defamation after making some allegations about his Russian involvement and the, Brexit, the, the role of the Brexit, Russia and the Brexit campaign uh, in broad terms. And she writes about her experience of being sued for defamation. And she talk, like, she's like, it's, it's, the, it's not just the money and the stress. It's like it, the silencing effect, being like trapped in this legal process it's like being she talks about it like the visceral emotional reaction that it breaks you as a person and she was being sued by a powerful man but not someone who she accused of raping or abusing her so for the women who are sued by their perpetrator it is like a continue many of the women we interviewed said it was like a continuation of a form of abuse even after having left him and having having taken herself out of a violent situation he's able to continue that abuse by weaponizing the legal system against her. Because think about it, these defamation cases are brought by men, they can do it of their own volition, they can accuse her of lying without having to make a police report and have her prosecuted for making a false report, which would be a much higher standard uh, for him to prove. If he's wealthy, he's got the resources to do it. A lot of women can't even afford to fight back. Um, they face bankruptcy. They face mental health issues um, to the point where a psychiatrist has talked about defamation. Her name is Jennifer Freud. Talks about defamation being a, a Davo tactic. I don't know if you guys know what Davo is, but I think it's like deflect, attack, reverse victim and offender. And defamation gives you a way in law to do that because by suing someone who's made an accusation against you, you make yourself the complainant and her the defendant. And so it's a really, um, it, for, for women who are going through this, the women we interviewed for the book, it's incredibly difficult. And I know myself, even as a lawyer going through it with, with Amber, for example, it was absolutely traumatic, even for me as a lawyer, let alone what it was like for her. Yeah, I think that there's um, a part in the book where you mentioned that, you know, when the actor Johnny Depp was suing the son, um, again, over an article that Amber Heard did not participate in. Um, it was a comment piece, I believe. Um, but you mentioned that the kind of, you know, the, the backlash, the, the intensity of it was at a level that you had never experienced before. Um, and, I mean, that was striking because obviously you have been a lawyer for Julian Assange and, and I kind of thought that there would be nothing more extreme than that, um, what you would have faced in that. But... Uh, can you speak at all about sort of the experience of, of being Amber Heard's lawyer during that um, the chaos? <laughs> yeah. um, just to, before, I'm happy to speak about it, but just to a brief summary of the two cases because I think it's important to understand what they are and the differences. So I represented Amber in the United Kingdom with respect to the legal action that was brought by Johnny Depp against the Sun newspaper. Uh, an opinion piece was written. So one Amber got, Am, Amber did everything that women are supposed to do, right? She went and got her, she didn't talk to the media. She went to a judge, got a restraining order and left. Then she signed a non-disclosure agreement as part of her divorce settlement and never spoke about the details of the violence ever again in public. People forget this. Uh, this then post Me Too, so this was 2016 when she got the restraining order before Me Too. Barely, I mean, it was controversial at the time, but it, you know, it was, then became a footnote in their profiles, right? It wasn't like they started a movement in Hollywood or Johnny Depp stopped getting work. He was still cast in J.K. Rowling's films. And after Me Too, people started asking questions. So there was an op-ed written in The Sun saying, um, you know, basically calling J.K. Rowling a hypocrite. Why is she all up in the Time's Up movement? if she's also casting a known wife beater in her films. 
No interview with Amber. She didn't speak to the media about it. She hadn't spoken about it since the restraining order. Um, and he sued for defamation. So she contacted me in the context of like, what do I do about this case? He's calling me a liar. What can I do about it? And so I worked with, she decided, she took the decision like Erin Jean Norville to give evidence. And so I worked with her for two years putting together that evidence, her witness evidence, reviewing text messages, medical evidence, the wealth of evidence that exists and was outlined by an expert and experienced judge when he concluded that he was violent towards her on 12 separate occasions. And they're just the incidents we pleaded and proved in court. She said very clearly in her evidence that there were others. So it's not, that's not an, that's not a, it was stated in the judgment and in her evidence in the court, so I'm, it's privileged, I'm not going to get sued, um, that this was just a sum of what she had experienced in, her, in their relationship. He then sues her personally in the United States, um, in Virginia, and wins before a jury. And what we watched play out in court um, was all the out... And this is what the Sun's lead counsel said, it was in a particularly fine piece of advocacy... Um, that his team had rolled out all of the outdated and facile arguments that judges are educated about, you know, discarding. Um, unfortunately, in front of a lay jury, they worked. In the context of that, we saw it in, like, the language that Depp used in his private text messages that became public in court, the misogynistic language about women. We saw that roll out across social media. So I have faced death threats in the Assange case, but I've never faced online trolling in the way that I did in that case. For Am and that pales in comparison to what Amber was getting. Every time she did a public appearance, including with us in Chambers, we had a, a Dowdy Street International Women's event and she came and spoke with me about being sued for defamation and every single woman who tweeted publicly in my Chambers about being at the event or about Amber got emailed, like, uh, got emails sent to our personal work, to our work addresses. So someone had taken the time to go and find all of our details and blasted out these emails claiming Amber was an abuser, that she was violent, that, you know, basically it happens to every film she's associated with, every beauty brand she was associated with, every person that's publicly associated with her would be trolled with this information. She's a terrible person. Do not associate with her. Do not defend her and don't work with her. It was n like nothing I've ever seen before. And there's since been on analysis done online by an organisation called Bot Sentinel showing that it was, there was a manipula platform manipulation. Now, it does the, we, there was no proof of who did it, but there was platform manipulation. And so during the... I wasn't at the US trial. I observed it um, from afar. I wasn't representing her in that trial, only in the UK trial. And I was horrified by the social media coverage of that trial. She was forced to give li evidence live-streamed on television and on YouTube of sexual violence. And if you, I don't know if anybody watched the live stream, but it was one of the most demoralizing things I have ever seen. A woman giving evidence live, streamed online with just the, the comments that were popping up every second, misogynistic comments about all the old tropes about rape and domestic violence. And then it's all over TikTok, cut up and shared. And I've got friends calling me saying, my kids are absorbing this stuff absorbing these tropes. We've got to educate our kids against this kind of stuff. It's absolutely demoralising and a sad reflection of where we are as a society. I thought we were, I thought we were beyond it. And I think um, a real, like, warning to a lot of women who would think about coming forward and reporting, and obviously, you know, perhaps they are not that high profile, but seeing what that cross-examination looks like, I think, you know, that is something that f friends have spoken about of, like, I would never want to go through something like that. 100%. Like, if you heard your family members, your friends, your work colleagues mocking Amber and her evidence in that case, why would you ever come forward with your own story? And anecdotally, I've been getting contact... Because people know I represent her, I've been contacted by so many lawyers who are like, this is devastating, I've got clients who are domestic abuse victims, they don't want to take their case forward now because of what they saw happen to Amber... They've, they've even reported stories to me of perpetrators threatening their partners, saying, don't be an amber, no one's going to believe you. There's merchandise available online, don't be an amber. Or my personal favourite, quoting one of Johnny Depp's text messages about her, flappy fish market. I mean, it's revo the, the fact that this guy gets away with using language like that is astonishing to me. Mm. And he's still revered. And no, no apology about that kind of language about women.
Mm, I, I think the, the difference between the, the trial in the UK and the US is something that, you know, lay non-lawyers mm. um, sort of struggle to understand with that case. And, and obviously we don't have to go into the minute details of it, but I, I think that that is really interesting that there are, there are two separate cases and people are just kind of able to choose their reality and just yeah. look at the US case and say, well, well he won. Um, when, you know, there's a judgment from the UK that says something very different. I, so the, the differences in the US system are interesting. So in the UK, the burden of proof is on the defendant. So if you're sued for defamation, you have to prove that what you wrote was true. The burden is on you to prove to the balance of prob- on the balance of probabilities it's true. In the US, it's the reverse. And they say that's for the better free speech protection under the First Amendment. The claimant must prove not only that it was not true, but that you said it with malice. So it's a much, much higher standard. And in fact, Amber's US legal team was like, look, we've already done this before. It's the same set of facts. Have a look at the British judgment. And in my opinion, it's absolutely absurd that we could win it in the United Kingdom on a more difficult standard of proof and yet win in front of a jury. And I reckon, I mean, there's a whole chapter in the, I don't want to take up the whole time talking about Amber and Johnny, but um, there's a chapter in the book where I write about my perspective on the trial. It's called Her Truth on Trial Twice to look at, from a comparative perspective, what happened. Um, And it's just... It's absurd to have a jury come to that outcome. And the, the jurors' comments after the case are so clear they did not understand the law and they were clearly swayed by the tropes that were rolled out by his team. Lawyers should not be running cases like that. And we should have ethical obligations not to, in my view. Um, as I was reading the book, I was quite surprised to come across these full pages that had been redacted. Um, you know, paragraphs that have been... Um, blacked out. <laughs> I felt like I was reading like something that I'd FOI'd from the government. I was <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, but, you know, and obviously, you know, these parts are uh, redacted because they relate to current court proceedings. Um, and I know that you can't speak about them, but what I did want to ask was just like, how hard is it to write a book like this? Like, even when you're two human rights lawyers, like... Media defence lawyers, I mean... (laughs) Like, is that... Like, it must be so difficult to be able to tell these women's stories um, and put them to the page. Yeah, I think, you know, it is very difficult. You know, both of us have worked advising journalists, working in-house, doing this for many years now. And so... the process is difficult because you you write the stories and then you end up legaling each other's work even before it goes to another per lawyer who has to legal it again and you need you know a really brave publisher as well who is going to stand by and publish a book such as this and I think one of the things we talk about in the book is just all these web of different laws that affects what you can say out once you want to talk about allegations of sexual abuse, intimate partner violence and rape. So it isn't just defamation, that's the risk. This is laws of contempt, right? And I think a lot of people maybe don't understand contempt law so well, but it is a potential uh, criminal offence, at least in the UK, if you breach contempt laws. So it's very serious repercussions um, if, if if you get it wrong. Um, I, I do want to ask about NDAs, but I feel like we're fast running out of time. Um, but uh, you do speak to Zelda Perkins in the book, who um, worked for Harvey Weinstein as an assistant mm. um, and broke her NDA to go public um, and speak about what had happened in working for him. Um, and it's kind of a bigger question that I've always had, and I'm not asking for legal advice, but (laughs) like when these companies use NDAs to settle when women are bringing forward sexual harassment or abuse claims, and you see it in the Weinstein case, it was systematic. There was a web of these NDAs that were keeping that private. Is there not some sort of occupational health and safety issue? Like, is there not some burden on these companies that they are putting their employees in a dangerous situation by by covering these things up? Well, yes. And one of the... So we interviewed Zelda Perkins, who blew the whistle and went public on Weinstein, but actually, Kane and I both have experience of advising lots of women on their non-disclosure agreements. So... um, 
we saw in our practice um, the kinds of cases where it does raise OHS questions, which is why we wanted to challenge it. For example, um, a woman, uh, I'm using a hypothetical and not using names because we can't talk about cases, but um, we have seen cases like this. A woman was working at a firm, a financial services firm. Her boss was coming on to her. She was trying to manage it as best she could, and then on a business trip, he like physically assaulted her. She pushed him off, reported it to HR, and when she got into the HR process, having reported it, she said it felt like a well-oiled machine. You know, an agreement was rolled out for her. She was paid off. It was all done very quickly, and in her view, she was like, "Well, look, I just." I don't want to make a big fuss about this. I don't want it to, I don't want to be publicly associated with this story, so I'm happy to sign an NDA. It suits me for my own privacy, uh, and I just want to get on with my life. But it felt, she said it felt like there was something that was not right about the situation. And then afterwards, she found out that the woman before her had been assaulted, and the woman after her was assaulted. But the only reason that they could figure that out is by breaching the terms of their non-disclosure agreement to talk to each other. So what non-disclosure agreements do is keep women in sight, what we talk about as silos of silence. And if you keep women in silos of silence, you're not going to learn that there's repeat perpetrators. But what was problematic about that is that the, they knew they knew that these women were coming into an unsafe workplace. And these women didn't know they were coming into an unsafe workplace, so they were also being denied the level of damages they ought to have been provided had there been full disclosure of what the situation was. But then for, her, for, um, for any of those women to challenge their NDAs, it's incredibly expensive, into the millions of pounds to challenge it. You'd have to go public. You might have anonymity for a certain period of time, but then once the NDA was broken open, if that you got that far, uh, that's your public, your identity associated with it. And I really want to recognise that a lot of women don't want to be associated with what was done to them, and we completely understand that, and every woman should be able to make that choice. But for those who do want to speak out, they ought to be able to. But the pro that's why I think it's really important for women to understand that when you sign a non-disclosure agreement, it is really hard to get out of it. It is a contract, you have been paid money for your silence, and it is really, most courts around the world will uphold the contract before your right to speak about it. And I guess we'll also create a big problem for a media organisation if they're trying to do a story, because... That's right, what people don't realise, once you sign a non-disclosure agreement, you're binding the world. So if a journalist wants to tell your story, you can't say, well, I signed the NDA, not you, it's fine. The journalist can be injuncted. So the newspaper can face an injunction to prevent them from reporting what they know is subject to a confidentiality agreement. And we see it all the time, all the time. And one of the arguments we make in the book is that, so the, the, the case law on this is really interesting. So in the post Me Too world, we've only had one case decided in the UK that's really about this. It was about Sir Philip Green, and we can name him because uh, a member of the House of Lords used parliamentary privilege to name him. So the initial story was... Um, High-profile businessman faces several Me Too accusations, but we can't publish it because he's got an injunction against us. Um, in the end, they named him in Parliament, but there was an initial judgment where the Daily Telegraph tried to challenge the injunctions. And basically they said, contract wins. Contract over free speech. That what they say is, if there is um, repeat perpetrating, we might, we might say that gets over the public interest threshold. And we're like, well, how do you even know if there's repeat perpetrating if you're in silos of silence? It's a chicken and egg problem, which basically means you silenced. <laughs> so it's a rare situation where you find out of more than one person facing these kinds of situations because of the non-disclosure agreements, the silence around it. Yeah, they're working as intended. Exactly. Mm. Um, I wanted to zoom out a bit, and I promise this is an optimistic question, but <laughs> sort of what you set out in the book is, you know, we live in a law that was largely made by men and largely enforced by men in order to serve men. And I wonder if it's actually possible to reform that law to serve everyone, or are we just trying to reshape clay that has already been fired? Like, is, is there practical things that can be done to, to fix what's going on? Yeah, I think, like, any of the... If there are any feminist law professors in the room, that's uh, <laughs> going to be a question that a lot of people ask in terms of can you use the master's tools to dismantle a master's house? So that's, you know, Audrey Lord asks that question. But I think one of the things, we, there are some simple things in this book that we suggest that can be done. And costs is clearly a massive issue. You cannot have 
newspapers having to pay 600,000, 700,000 pounds just to try and publish an allegation in relation to, there's a, a case we discuss, El Finke, who was an MP who was convicted of sex offences and yet he was able to bring a defamation claim to try and stop those um, claims from being reported and the, the, the Times paid £600,000 defending that even before it got to court. So we've got to tackle costs. And the other thing really is the public interest. We have to have the courts recognise that there's a public interest in women and survivors and everyone being able to speak their truth and being able to tell their own stories. And I think uh, we mentioned the Colombian example earlier, but you know, I was really heartened to see that in, um, like Me Too allegations are protected speech in Colombia in, in the constitution. Um, that was, I didn't know that, and it feels like something that f does feel like a big step forward. Yeah, I love the Colombian Constitutional Court. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> They're great. They've given rivers rights, for example. There's a rights of nature. I mean, that's incredible. Um, and in terms of uh, these types of cases, they've called it digital escrache. Mm -hmm. And escrache is a term that comes from uh, back in the uh, Argentinian dictatorship um, when there wasn't judicial just justice. People would um, speak out and name people that were involved in the dictatorship. Um, and that tradition has continued and now it, it, it happens online. But what the Constitutional Court of Colombia has said is that when you look at those weighing scales on the right to reputation versus the right to free speech, you must also include the right to be free from violence and also the right to equality. And, and very interestingly, just going back to the NDA example, also when it happens in the university space, it should also include the right to education. So, and, and I think it's the most progressive judgments that we've seen so far. Mm. All the judgments have related to people speaking out about their own abuse or being friends of, of someone speaking out about abuse. Um, what we haven't seen yet is a case where a journalist has printed um, an allegation and uh, the court reaching that conclusion. And that, that case is pending before the court. And, mm -hmm. and we talk about Catalina and Matilda's case in there. So they're facing five lawsuits at the moment mm -hmm. by the same film director. We'll be very interested to see what happens. Hopefully they'll win. Yeah. yeah. I'm just trying to spy Rosemary because she's kindly giving me a countdown. We've, perfect. <laughs> I, I have two more questions, so that is perfect. Um, I guess this question is quite Australian-centric, but the new Labor government has um, made a pledge very recently that they want to end violence against women within a generation. Um, and I think... You know, it's a very important statement to make, um, but in reading through the plan, you know, there is no mention of defamation reform and there is no mention of, um, you know, reforming how non-disclosure agreements are used to um, silence women. And I was just wondering if, if you thought or felt like those things are very important uh, in terms of a plan or a strategy to end violence against women, that there are things that we need to consider in the broader picture of, of what's happening. Well, absolutely. That's why we wrote the book. We wrote the book because for us, if we're going to tackle violence against women, we need to be able to speak about it. You can't deal with what you don't know. So we need to understand the problem and the extent of the problem. So we need to allow women to be able to talk about it and foster that conversation in our society. Um, and so that's why we wrote the book, because we wanted to highlight that it actually is really difficult. Um, Non-disclosure agreements were actually reviewed in the context of some Human Rights Commission inquiries around workplace practices in Parliament and the like. Uh, and, and the review respect at work inquiry. And sadly, there were recommendations to amend the way that non-disclosure agreements work um, and they were not adopted. So that I really do think we need to look at it. Um, we cover Zelda Perkins' campaign in the book. It's a campaign called Can't Buy My Silence because she's so she's working with a Canadian professor, Professor Julie McFarlane, on this campaign because she was so frustrated that in the wake of all of the controversy around the Weinstein NDAs, there has been zero law reform in the UK. And so I worked, um, I made submissions to the Women and Equalities Committee in the British Parliament on this issue, making recommendations about what could be done and, and nothing has happened in terms of law reform in the UK either. Uh, one of the recommendations is, is that 
women can choose to, to protect their identity under the terms of the agreement if they elect to do so, but they should not be prevented from talking about what happened to them. Um, now, a lot of workplaces, and there's a huge amount of self-interest in the legal profession around protecting NDAs as they exist now. So I do think that's something we need to talk about. Um, but our defamation laws are important. I w well, I have certainly hoped that with a new public interest defence in our uniform defamation laws that was implemented last year, that picks up on, it it's implements basically the same defence that we've been working with in the UK for the past 10 years, uh, the Section 4 defence. Um, and we want to see more judges and we want to see lawyers pleading it and we want to see judges acknowledging it, that women's right to speak about their experience of domestic violence and sexual violence is a matter of public interest. And so that defence should provide a full defence in law to any defamation claim. Yeah, and I think that there's something that you mentioned in the book. Um, I'm not sure what country it was in relation to, I'm sorry, but you were talking about, you know, a woman's intention when she spoke out with a Me Too claim being something that needed to be factored in. Um, and I think that that feels like a real evolution of how these things are spoken about because so often it's seen as from a spectrum of she's causing trouble to she's lying. There is no <laughs> positivity in the spectrum of she's trying to warn other women, she's trying to improve the situation. Um, so I think that that was a really interesting thing to hear that that is being factored in in some countries um, to, you know, humanise these people who are coming forward with allegations. Yeah, I think I think that's right, you know, and that was another, a different Colombian constitutional it's court case. It's always the Colombians. It's always the Colombians. <laughs> They're wonderful. There's been four cases so far before the Colombian Constitutional Court. Um, but, you know, when Australia is looking at its plan, and obviously I'm, I'm not Australian, as you might guess from my accent, but, you know, it's part of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. There is General Recommendation Number 35, updating General Recommendation Number 19 on Violence Against Women. There are clear state obligations on how states can go about ending violence against women out there. It's not like politicians are having to look around and think, oh, where can I find these standards? I don't know. Well, actually, you know, they're there, they're on paper, really expert lawyers have been drafting them and working on them for years. So the law is there, they need to implement them. The UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression has been talking about this weaponization of the law and silencing women and um, has been calling it gendered censorship and has been reminding states constantly that you know, the right to live your life free from violence is also indivisible from freedom of expression. So I think states need to do their homework, read up on their international law obligations and start implementing it. Um, just finally, and very briefly, I just wonder, are you both hopeful that these things that you're talking about in, in this book can, can make it possible for a woman to come forward and, and speak about what has happened to her without, you know, it being a roll of the dice, it, without it being, is he going to bring the full force of the law down on me or is he going to, you know, let it be a sword of Damocles hanging over my head? for a few years. I, th I think so many women live in that space, thinking about these questions, and do you feel like it's, it's possible to, to move us beyond the situation that we're in now? I absolutely think that we can improve things. Um, but what, this is one of the reasons why we wrote the book. The book is not legal advice, there's a big disclaimer in the front. <laughs> um, but we, we wrote it because to be informed is to be empowered, and we want to provide more women, um, women in particular, but we use women in an inclusive um, manner in the book. We want people to be in, informed about the legal risks they face. A lot of people don't realise the moment you're raped or abused, the law regulates what you can say to whom and when, and there are legal risks at every turn. Um, we want people to understand that. And obviously we would advise people to take specialist legal advice before you do speak out, and too many women don't, and tweet about it and then come to us for advice afterwards. Too many women think, well, it's true, so he can't sue me, and sadly they sue anyway, um, and you have, to, it's up to, you have to prove it in court. And so we want to actually empower people. It is possible to speak out about this. It is possible for journalists to be able to report on it. And we have to do better as a society and do better in our courts and do better in the media in how we talk about it and how we treat women who choose to speak out. Because every single time we see a woman pilloried, 
criticised, attacked for speaking out, it silences so many more women. Kena, Jen, thank you so much. Um, it's been wonderful to speak with you both. Um, could everyone join me in thanking them for being here? And it's, well, the time, once the applause dies down, it's very important to say that um, both Jen and Kena will be signing copies of the book out in the lobby. This is obviously a special edition with redactions in it, so... Collector's edition. Yeah, it's a collector's as soon as, as soon as the judgment comes down, the Lehman trial will be, um, we'll be releasing the full book and what we have to say about that, but we obviously can't say anything about it until the verdict is delivered. Yeah. So this will be the last redacted version. So you can get it signed in the, uh, in the lobby. And yeah, thanks again to both of you. And thank you for writing this book. Thank you so much. <laughs>